Before we start, a confession. Everything I'm about to say is bullshit. <laughs> and that's after a lifetime of trying to solve for what's going on in here, why we act crazy, and how to design to that. I've been trying to solve for why humans contribute so strongly to social problems, how to design for it at large scale uh, for my entire life starting with myself on Apple IIe's in my bedroom and uh, uh, TI-80 calculators, programmable when you could remember, or even the ones that flipped open and had like the keyboard on the side, yeah. Yes, that old, right? After they invented the wheel, I think those calculators came out. Thank you for nodding and making me not feel so old. So even after all of that time, I started out with a lot of uh, going into the in, in various industries, actually, with a lot of bravado and thinking I knew how to solve this. And even after uh, starting the first uh, social network for goal achievement, first gamified social network, one of the uh, very first apps for, on Facebook for behavior change, um, uh, being the founder of the design group at LeapFrog Toys, um, working with BJ Fogg and doing research for a number of years there, uh, et cetera, et cetera, doing a lot of other things. I have learned the biggest lesson I can tell you is to be humble. Please be humble. If you think you know the answer to how to solve for somebody else's behavior, much less your own, be highly suspicious of that instinct. Highly suspicious. If you're doing testing, if you're doing research and you're celebrating, you're probably doing it wrong. OK, we'll go on from there. That's still what I can share is still going to be many steps beyond uh, what our intuition has been and why so many products are failing. Um, products, programs, services, policies. So it will still be beneficial. I'm not irrational. You are. No, actually, we all are. How many of you, play along now, nobody's sitting out this evening. How many of you have maybe heard, possibly, that it might be kind of important, a little bit, to once in a while eat a vegetable? Hands in the air. Play along. Come on. We're gonna have, not going to have fun if we don't have hands in the air. <laughs> let's go. All right. Some of you are like, hell no, I'm not playing. OK. <laughs> How about, let's keep raising them. How many of you heard that veggies are important, or fruit might be important, or exercise might be important, or sleep might be important, or saving, or driving phone free, or being sustainable? OK, thanks for playing that part. Now, keep your hands up if you actually do those things as much as you're supposed to. OK, the data shows just on the health parts, less than 1% of Americans are doing the health, basic health behaviors they're supposed to be doing. So, the basic recommendations from American Heart Association. But how many of you are obsessed, like I am and all of us are, with social media, video games, sports, binge watching t Netflix, or any of these other things that have no survival value? All right, well, let's be honest. OK, some of you are very strong. Um, what, what is up with that? Why do these things that have limited survival value in the evolutionary context, or none at all, or in fact are hurting us, or we are very actively aware that they're hurting us, or we've at least seen the data that it's hurting us, are we so, uh, at least uh, addicted might not be a right word, but obsessive about them, or compulsive about them? Our brains, so, so this is the question, why is that? That's really, really weird. We're such advanced creatures, right? Um, why don't we do what we intend to do? We actually plan. We'll wake up and say, I'm not touching that video game today. I'm not binge watching tonight. I'm going to bed on time, right? I'm not looking at social. I'm not checking Twitter during the day. And why don't other people do what we expect them to do? Our spouses, our friends, our kids, our users, our audience, whoever it is we're designing for, they don't behave like we expect them to. And then we run into trouble when we try to design for that. Why is that? That's so weird. So let's smash some myths first of all. There are a lot of solutions people go to that don't work. It's not because people are lazy or uninterested or incapable or unaware or uninformed or unintelligent. It's not about motivation. It's not about education. 
It's not even about incentives. You can have all of those things. And in fact, people throw those things at people all the time, and they still don't do what they should do. In fact, we work inside organizations that are focused on solving problems like this, or consult with, I should say, um, who still have trouble. They know the knowledge. They have, they're working on it daily. Their motivation is high. They know the problems. They're still not following through. We don't understand ourselves, even with the best of current knowledge in science, with all those millions of man hours, and human hours, and people hours, and machine hours. We still don't fully understand that we've come light years recently. Our intuitions are very often wrong. So countless costly, clever, committed people, uh, committed efforts to help people across all different areas of society are running into this problem that they're, they're failing miserably because of this disconnect. Some would say 70% failure, depending on how you look at it, can be upwards of 95% failure. And that's everywhere, which is why you're seeing such a revolution in interest in behavioral design, behavioral economics, behavioral science, social, cognitive science, across a lot of different industries, because everyone's finally realizing, hey, we've thrown millions at this for decades now, and we're still not getting it right. What are we missing? Lots of lost time, money, and heartache. But after all that doom and gloom, there's a bright spot. This is, there, there's good, good to come. So the outline what we're going to cover, what is behavioral design? Why do humans act like numbskulls? The hero behavioral design framework, which is something that, uh, that I, together with the help of others, have developed over a long period of time to systematize solutions for how to approach design. And within that state model to get clarity on situations, action model to, get, to drive action. Uh, and the progression model, basically to understand the journey people need to go through to get, how do we put those actions together to get from where somebody is to the outcomes we're after. So, behavioral design, what is it? How many of you have heard of that term before? A lot, okay, that's good. I would have to respond to people saying, but you're never gonna get somebody on the internet every day, and so, even when I moved to Austin eight years ago um, and started the Action Design Meetup, which has been going on for seven, eight years now here, then nobody had heard of this and it wasn't a thing. And now it's exploding worldwide and uh, the Action Design Network, of uh, which I'm a, uh, an officer, we have, uh, we're enrolling people in other countries and, and new, new uh, uh, chapters and things. And, uh, around the world, so it's pretty exciting times and strange to see it change so much. There's a renaissance in the behavioral sciences going on, and arguably in many sciences related to our trying to understand why people do what they do. You've got big breakthroughs going on in neuroscience, behavioral science, behavioral economics, social science, cognitive science, evolutionary psych, social work, positive psychology, real-time brain imaging, big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning, blah, blah, you've heard all these, these terms. But all of this is amounted to the ability to measure a lot more of what people do and test variations of that. Are there problems with all this? Absolutely. Is it better than we, what we had before? Absolutely. That helps us understand why people do what they do and how um, that might be manipulated. But how, understanding how we do something with that, that's been the confusing part. For those of you who have studied a lot of behavioral economics, you might uh, feel like you've got all these different insights, like people respond to this bias and that bias and, and this weird thing and that weird thing. But when you sit down to solve a problem, you have this big bag grab, bag, bag grab, grab bag <laughs> of insights, and you don't really know where to begin, right? How do you, how do you fit that into your, um, into your design thinking process? So that's what we've been trying to solve, and that's what... Um, the behavioral um, design field is about. So there's a lot to be pulled in from experience design, product design, service design, event design, blah, blah, all these different areas, as well as lots of different media, which have rich, rich traditions of knowing how to keep your attention on things that don't have immediate survival benefit. They have, of course, many more subtle survival uh, benefits. But video games, social media, filmmaking, viral content, immersive theater, marketing, advertising, propaganda, persuasion. The Venn diagram, the way 
that we look at it is that we're pulling a lot from all the science, but the behavioral science leaves us knowing the why, but the how comes down to uh, uh, pulling from all these fields that have achieved a tremendous amount of engagement in areas that aren't necessarily practical tools, or they have practical tools, but there's um, a lot of specific strategies across here that go beyond um, what, the, what the science is, is able to offer when you look at a particular cognitive strategy or, or bias. And then ultimately, we're all trying to build something. We're trying to solve real world problems. And so ultimately, can you produce a model that helps you know what to do when within actual development process? And that's what we've tried to solve, and that's what we've been able to bring to projects for lots of really cool companies and solve really cool problems. Middle of that Venn diagram is what I call behavioral design. It's evidence-based process, both pulling from the academic research and other sources of rigorous research, which industry offers a lot of now as well. It's more holistic and that we're pulling from a, a lot of uh, dimensions that intuitively we don't feel like are as important. Um, it's more meticulous. All the design thinking, of course, is meticulous as well. But when you know which rabbit holes to go sniffing down, you end up with a level of meticulousness in, in specific areas that is uh, much, much deeper than you might expect is valuable. And then we're able to design for off-medium behavior. So that's a big problem is that you don't always have a device or a product or a tool or a message or a media that is at the moment where behavior or decision is being made. So how do you design for something that they're doing by actually going away? And then designing for future behavior. Very often, you have a chance to give an impression, but the behavior is going to happen a minute, an hour, a later, a month later. And so how can you influence that? There's a lot that the literature has to say about that as well as uh, design methods. Why do we act crazy? OK, here's why. Honestly. After 4.5 billion years of evolution, we're still more cavemen, cave women, cave people than we like to admit. Way more. We love to think of ourselves as being ad way, well advanced from the apes, and we are, but not nearly as much as we think we are. We are optimized very well for the ancient four Fs. So fighting, foraging, feeding, and f Okay. I was going to say we spotted the perverts in the audience, but not, that was pretty much everybody. Uh, fooling around. We are not optimized for the modern four Fs. Fast food, Facebook, fake news, and Netflix. <laughs> Our focus, perception, evaluation, memory, logic, decision making, predictions, and willpower all suck. They're so much worse than we think, and yet we, we expect that of ourselves of others and our users and our audience. We design assuming we can give them instructions and they'll remember it later, that they will be able to understand the ramifications of the decisions they make, that they can evaluate complex choices you give them, that they will read long pieces of text or that they can figure your stuff out. They will not. We don't. How much patience do you have for that? But we uh, like to think we do. We pretend we do. We forget when we don't. We have all kinds of biases that make us think that all of this works. OK, so there's the ancient part of the brain that has been evolving for a very, very long time, right? And then this modern part. This is the part that when we look at our ancestors, we have this sloped, they have this sloped for, uh, forehead, right? And this is the part that bulbed out this huge expansion of the uh, cortex and the prefrontal cortex in modern history and the evolution of modern humans. This older part of the brain, this is known as system one. So this is the ancient, non-conscious, automatic, emotional, very fast um, part of the brain. This, this is where um, behaviorism is. This is, has been a system that's worked very well for, for uh, forever to solve problems, for, to keep uh, organisms alive, but always stuck in the now. It doesn't understand the future or the past. It can't predict very far from the moment that something's happening. The reward has to happen immediately for that behaviorism to work. 
So it's really focused on immediate gratification. So it was a huge revolution that, uh, that uh, evolution would invest so much in something called, that we call system two, which is the young, conscious, logical, ex uh, very expensive, slow uh, part of the brain that's able to plan for things, that's able to deliberate, think of pros and cons, and, uh, and imagine the future and potential futures, and figure out what might be beneficial and that perhaps doing something now that hurts now or costs now would be much, much more beneficial in the future. That system too was a big deal, so much so that in the process we gave up claws and night vision and being able to swing from the trees and be able to do, uh, be able to have huge muscles and hair and all kinds of things, um, advantages that other animals have, we gave up in exchange for this. So why is that and what does that mean? Um, in addition to that, that whole, that whole machinery has lots and lots of flaws in it, lots of them. As uh, if you look at just, you know, behavioral economics is just constantly running away with cataloging them. There's, there's hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, and of course, behavioral science and social science and cognitive science has been doing that for decades. So hooray, behavioral economics for reading their their behavioral science textbooks. And so one of the weird biases, though, is that we're blind to our biases. There's a thing called bias blindness. You can have experts who study a particular bias and try to avoid it, and they will have trouble uh, preventing themselves from falling prey to it. They have problems recognizing that they have fallen prey to it. They're better than the rest of us, but these things are deep, deeply seated inside of, of who we are and what's going on. And in order to function day to day, we've had to not be obsessed with all of the mistakes. We have to have an optimism bias to just keep going and keep trying things. And so that optimism bias is related to this, this bias around not seeing our errors. There's an, another bias called the fundamental attribution error, which makes us very acutely aware of other people's errors and mistakes and flaws. And not only do we notice them, but instead of saying, oh, they're doing that because they're stressed or hungry or tired or probably there's some other reason that I'm not aware of or the weather's bad or they're going through you know, bad time, instead we say, oh, they're lazy, they're ignorant, they're the wrong gender, the wrong sex, the wrong, uh, wrong background, they're, they're not you know, this or that. And, all those things I listed in the beginning, we tend to moralize other people's errors because uh, the social side of, of humanity is super, super important and we need to be very, very aware of who we can uh, cooperate with and who we can um, share resources with and get reciprocity from. But it's sort of over, over uh, all these biases have sort of overshot in many ways. And the result is that many, many world problems we're quick to find people to blame. It's the victim's fault, or it's this perpetrator, or that perpetrator, or I wouldn't have done that in this situation, or if I was responsible for solving that, I would have taken care of that. And yet, when we're working on our own tiny corner of the world and solving problems for our audience, how many of us have, if you've been around enough projects long enough, very often they decay into this point where if they're not working, start blaming the user. They're monkeys at the t keyboard. They're, they're like, if they were just smarter, if they just cared more, if they were just more motivated, if they just understood, then they would realize how smart my design is. Well, they would take advantage of this public policy or this resource or this thing that's in front of them. Instead of recognizing, we're instead blind to our own biases where if we were in that same situation, we would behave, behave in a very similar way. And in fact, you can very quickly take for example, people who are in poverty and making choices in a certain way that's easy to judge and then take people who are wealthy and put them under similar duress and find in a, in a um, test setting and find them making equally perplexing decisions. So and it's, um, there are a, a variety of ways of looking at that. So one of the things I would ask you to do besides being humble is to have a lot of compassion for your users and, and audience. And when you 
find something not working and you find yourself getting worked up and emotional about why they're wrong, instead of giving into that with your team, or your clients for that matter, I should say, how many of you, it's easier to complain about clients often than it is the end user, right? Try to recognize that that is a, is a flag or an alert that there's an opportunity there. If you can get around your bias, there's probably something you understand about behavior or decision making or humans or the situation that you could have this great insight and break on through in your product. So let's dig into the, the hero behavioral design framework. It's got three parts. The state model is about getting clarity. So of course the uh, design thinking is, is very much on the right track. We're, we're doing design thinking here. We're doing some variations on the approach and, and techniques involved here. But getting clarity on the factors involved in why somebody is doing what they're doing and their likelihood, uh, the, the forces that are, can be at play as to why they may or may not proceed through a whole process. And you can look at that at the beginning, at any moment in the middle, but certainly in the beginning you want to get clarity on that. The state change model is then, we know the state someone's in, how do we get them to take a step and a step and a step? And the change model is not only about at, at the granularity of how do we go from uh, eating no vegetables to eating one, uh, one serving a day, but down to um, how do we get them, they've read the first paragraph of the email we sent them, how do we, or not the first paragraph, the first half of the sentence, how do we get them to make sure they read the other half of the sentence? That's the level of granularity that this, that, that could be used at, and, uh, and we do, but of course not everywhere, all the time, you're looking for strategic areas to do it, right? And then the progression model, so how do you look at this whole journey? What are some standard phases that people go through? and how do we design to those, and often they provide some standard uh, solutions to getting action and clarity to, be in, to keep in mind. So first, behavioral state model. These basic uh, pieces of insights are things that are in our heads constantly, and many teams have found are, are things they can grasp quickly and are enormously powerful to just keep using all the time and, and are, are able to remember. So the main thing I want to get to here that we want to focus on is that is this part of this holistic view is that it's helpful to think of behavior happening on six different dimensions. So you've got uh, mental, emotional, and physical internal dimensions to bear in mind. At any given moment, all of these are at play. So you might think, oh, my product's not social. It's always social. People are inherently, we would die I mean, the, the evidence is clear, babies die very young if they don't have social, I mean, obviously babies do, but um, even if you feed and clothe them, if they don't get held, if they don't have any oxytocin, they die young. And then the, the external uh, forces, the dimensions, the social dimension, the material dimension, and the temporal dimension. So mental is basically, these are colloquial terms that you can easily remember, mental, physical, emotional, social, material, and temporal. The mental is cognitive decision-making, willpower, uh, remembering, recalling, all those kinds of things, reading, so system two. The emotional part is the, one of the important parts of uh, system one, which is how the um, emotions bubble up from the unconscious. And the physical is particularly the sensory experience, like how they are consuming their connection to the outside world, as well as the physical, the, the muscular systems, which allow you to act in the world, to do things, the effort. Um, and then social is, of course, your, your social environment, all the other people. Material is all of the things between you and another person. So this is the resources you concern, consume, the tools you use, the environmental factors like rain or darkness or cues in the environment. And then temporal is time. How do we sit in time? And we already started to see how system one and system two treat time very, very differently. And that's one of the big, big problems in driving human behavior. Going back to this model, the modern and ancient brain helps us understand why some of the key takeaways I want uh, to, to draw your attention to in these six dimensions. So mental effort sucks. We sort of touched on this, but 
this part of the brain, the, the cognitive uh, system too, is very uh, ounce for ounce, the most calorie expensive part of the body to, you, to run. And so your brain doesn't like to run it more than necessary. We are, the, the definition, humans, the, the, another word for lazy is efficient. If you think that you or other people don't like to do a lot of thinking, it's true. We don't like to do a lot of thinking unless our, our neurology has identified a valuable enough reason to do it. And the cognitive part is more expensive to run than the other part. And all of those functions it does are less uh, effective than we thought they were. And yet we continuously expect to be able to give people instructions, have them follow them later on, to give them lots of text and explanations, lots of menu options, have lots of decisions, um, have them recall things, do all kinds of things that are, are apply willpower. In fact, willpower is, pro is potentially not even a thing. It's possible that that's just a myth that we like to use to blame ourselves and others. Now, that, that's a big one. Avoid like the plague as much as you can. Where am I assuming? We just over assume and we don't realize how much friction we're putting into our products. Okay, so remember I had talked about this interesting, like why did this huge investment and explosion of that part of the brain happen? The trade-off, the benefit that we got is that we were able to become social. We got rid of all of these crazy superpowers in terms of fighting and seeing in the dark and swinging from trees and bought this expensive part of the brain that, took, that was very, very complex and took a long time to evolve in exchange for being able to be social, not just being able to be, but craving it and being driven to do it. And, and in fact, the data shows that being social, the, the happiness research is showing uh, that more and more all the different kinds of social are really the most reliable and repeatable ways to, uh, to find happiness and fulfillment in life, more so than in many of the other ways. And why is that? Because in order, when, one good explanation is that when fire was invented, it gave extra hours in the day, but you had to be huddled around the fire for light and protection. And when we look at the, the data around that, that allowed for, um, that the types of conversations started shifting at that point into more knowledge sharing than moment by moment st strategy. So starting to reflect on the day became more important. You started to have to be living much more in much more proximity with a, a larger group of people that allowed language to start to arrive, which allowed for joint learning that now you could learn not only uh, things that were happening to you immediately, but from the learnings of your whole tribe and in fact generations of people and in fact messages that had been transferred over thousands of miles from other organizations. So suddenly the, the learning ability of humans leapt forward. Also, humans began to be able to hunt in groups, but bringing down, uh, hunting groups allowed, to bring down, allowed us to bring down larger prey, which couldn't be preserved. So it had to be shared immediately or wasted, but you wanted to keep track of who was, uh, who was reciprocating when you shared with them and who was freeloading. So it started to become very important to not just fall prey to those four Fs. Those four Fs are critical drivers of behavior still now. We see fear uh, you know, leading to fight or flight or freezing being a primary source of uh, driving attention in the media and in the, uh, in all kinds of, uh, in, in politics and many other areas today. It's gotten to a fevered pitch, right? Um, those elements have to be tamed to be able to live in a society because you can't immediately punch somebody that you're mad at anymore. You have to remember that person's still likely to share their buffalo with me when it comes down. And I have to remember that that person shared with me last time. I'm pointing at you because you look like a sharer. <laughs> Um, so suddenly you're keeping track of a large number of people, what their relationship to you is, that's the chief's wife, that's so-and-so's daughter, that's, so -and -so, that's my you know, best friend's buddy from college, don't punch him either. Like, there's, there's, you can't immediately give in to the 4S. You can't, you're controlling that all the time. So there suddenly became the need to be much more sophisticated and much more aware of the future consequences of behavior. But in exchange, you got this, this 
a super organism around you that was hunting for you, helping defend you, helping train you, helping raise your kids. And in fact, our kids are not even fully uh, ev um, uh, done. They, they actually have what can be argued as a fourth trimester outside the body. Most animals can, be, uh, can start walking and feeding shortly after being born. Humans are super uh, incapable and in fact for a long time, certainly right away, but for many, many years, we have to invest a lot of resources into them being able to do what we need them to do. So it takes a tribe to be able to afford to squeeze that giant head out. And um, so therefore, social became super important and basic functions of social engagement began to be rewarded uh, neurologically, like connection, like uh, the value of oxytocin in all kinds of social engagement, including just saying hi to the person at the checkout who you've never seen before. Even random social interactions have that benefit. And then temporal, so we talked about system one and system two having very different views, but we have maximized, we have like dominated as a species globally on our ability to fulfill that immediate gratification, right? We have like need calories, we give you a thousand times more calories than you could possibly need in this moment, you know, delivered to your house within 30 minutes by this, you know, by many, many sources and we're trying to make that faster, right? Or it's in your freezer or it's in your pantry, I mean, Deli calorie delivery, amazing. Foraging is like a thing of the past. We do that for fun now. Um, uh, safety, we love to think it's a scary world. Nobody here is gonna die from, uh, from, from terrorism. The, the new flu is, we've, we've seen lots of these like super flus come through. Eventually one of them's gonna be massive, but the terror level is not nearly proportional to what's really killing us which is how much we've dominated immediate gratification, our own behavior, all of the major killers for humans in developed countries is our own personal behavior. Your own brain is thousands of times more dangerous than any terrorist will ever be. And yet we still pull out that mobile phone, check in our messages while we're driving, still shoving that food in our mouth, we're still doing a lot of very dangerous behaviors, right? We're not exercising enough. But no blame. This is like we as a species are ha trying to solve for this now and build technology that helps shore up where our neurology has been at gap, uh, has had a, has a large uh, gap. Um, and all of our big global problems are directly related to behavior, whether it's getting in yourself into a problem in the first place, whether it's people trying to help you get out of a problem, whether it's the aggressors perpetrating a problem, or whether it's these long-term, like really deep issues that require society to really pull themselves together, like dealing with sustainability, or dealing with global pandemics, or super volcanoes, or the flat earth problem. All, the, all of those problems, to be more specific, are where the benefit is far in the future. And that's practically useless as a motivator. We're better at it than a lot of animals, but we have created such temptations in the moment that are amped way beyond what evolution could ever have prepared us for. So we're fighting these like enormous uh, immediate temptations and trying to solve something that will happen in our children's lifetime, perhaps, or that will happen late in life, longer, than our ancestors who evolved to be this way even lived, right? So why would our brains be very good at being able to plan for retirement when retirement wasn't even a thing? But all of that pales to something that I really want to draw attention to, which is that system one, that original brain, part of the brain, really drives everything. Now it's pretty clear, like maybe here and there you can argue we can be very dispassionate, make a decision. Almost always that's a fading uh, idea now. There, that's not possible. It's always the cognitive brain comes up with something that it thinks is best to do and then tries to lobby system one to go along with it. System one makes the decisions. If it thinks that it's gonna reduce the terror level and in, in the fear 
or the worry or it's going to feed some kind of emotional gain, then it will go along with it. Otherwise, we've got this problem where all of us have no we should do things and we don't do them. And the people we're trying to serve are doing the same thing. Yeah, I, I guess water. I was wondering where, where systemic like design fits into all of this because you've kind of mentioned, you, know, you gave the example of you know, you take a you take a person and you put them into a situation under duress, mm -hmm. and they they exhibit the same behavior. Yeah. And I agree with a lot of the things you're saying about human behavior, but there is the, the kind of system in place. So, yeah. so where does that kind of fit in in this framework? As good as things have become in many many areas, like the issues that remain are so serious and severe that all of us need to tackle them from all sides. So I'm not a uh, the the argument is that we, the, in, in my whole purpose is large scale change, social change and behavioral change. So it is about how do you change policy. Many, many policies don't actually drive the outcomes that they're after. They're, it's like we have a non-scientific approach to apply, choosing and then applying and retiring policy. Um, it's about how we build our environments and build our, our you know, rules and laws and how we, and our uh, incentive structures and our work and our relationships and our media. It's, we're mostly in a built environment with with built messaging now. So absolutely, it's it's got to be hit from all different angles. And luckily, it is. Like, the explosion of interest is a lot of different industries from a lot of different angles are recognizing that they've been getting something wrong, and we need to figure this out and approach it from all different sides. So yes. So let's see how to do that. It's really more. One is, you know, for all of you as designers to keep those things in mind. This is not, was not at all intended uh, to mean this is what the individual needs to deal with because you, we pretty much can't. That's what we're saying is that we need to build our technology to, uh, or our built environment to be more uh, supportive of the behaviors and decisions and feelings that we want to foster. So because emotions are so important, like everything comes down to emotions, all business is so show business. So if you think, uh, if somebody's building a tool that has a practical purpose, that is not enough. People will not use it. Practical, the better mousetrap does not get used. It has to feel better as well. In fact, we have lots and lots of examples of people, products that are better but feel worse that don't get used, right? You can buy fine clothing, t-shirts at the dollar store but all of us here are spending, you know, tens or hundreds of dollars more for our clothes because of a lot of emotional and social reasons. So if you, people are not uh, buying drills to get holes, they're not buying drills for the drill, they're not buying for the hole, they're not buying for the chair or the project that they're going to use that drill for, they're buying it for the feeling that doing that project is going to give them. They have a, an activating emotion in the first place that gives them a craving or fear they're trying to resolve, and they're hoping that drill will solve it. If that drill works better than anything else out there to solve it, but doesn't actually resolve the emotional inequilibrium, then it's a failed product, and we see lots and lots of that, whereas you'll see lots of products that almost deliberately work worse but feel better, and people purchase those. So we all need to become both uh, toy makers and tool makers. The behavioral action model. So um, that was a, a minuscule part of you know, just knowing the six dimensions. But um, so how do we drive behavior then? So we have a target action. We have a person who's not interested. Uh, we get their attention. They're deciding whether to pursue it or not. One of the things they're doing, both non-consciously and consciously, is evaluating the predicted gains, and in fact, the predicted emotional gains. And if they get enough of those, uh, and so they're also looking at the predicted costs, the predicted emotional costs. And if the costs in their evaluation outweigh the gains, then they're quitting your product, or policy, or program, or tool, or anything that you're doing. And if you get the gains to appear above the costs, then they're sticking with you for the next step, just the next step. And it goes on and on like that. So this allows for a clear uh, one place we can focus, a way to, to look at 
each step we're asking someone to do and think about across the six dimensions. What are we asking them to do? What are we um, offering them in exchange in that moment? And, uh, and what's in their head as they make that decision? So this balance we call emotional ROI because it's and ultimately the emotions that matter. It doesn't matter how much money is on the table. So a uh, $1,000 expenditure for two different billionaires, one of whom will struggle with that $1,000 because they got rich because they were so t careful with their money. Um, and another billionaire can't wait to spend $1,000 to show off, to show their wealth, to, to enjoy their wealth, right? So, um, but by and large, uh, the, usually it's going to be on the, on the cost side. People don't want to spend money. But um, what it means to the individual has to do with their emotional connection to that money in that moment. So it ultimately is how does it resolve emotionally. And we know, all know people have very different attachments to things like money or social connections or social shaming or um, different things like that. So looking at these two, you're always trying to get the predicted emotional costs to be less than the predicted emotional gains, which what that allows you to do is focus on two things, driving those costs down and then providing gains. And what another uh, adjective you could put in there is immediate gains and immediate costs, because also future costs are uh, barely registered in many cases. And that it can be, you can meticulously go through that at any given moment. So if you look at your, your funnel or your metrics and find out where you're losing people and target that and say, what am I asking them to do? What costs am I having them do? Am I having them read too much? Is it too complicated what I'm asking them to read? Is it too blended together? Is it uh, the sensor orally? Is the text too small? Is it too gray? Um, emotionally, am I bringing up subjects that they have bad reaction to? Uh, is the imagery in such a way that, it's, uh, that it's, it has negative associations to it? Um, socially, am I asking them to do something that's shaming? Like, uh, if, for example, if you're, if you're doing something like logging food, which is, a, which is projects we end up working on a fair amount, um, have, having to pull something out and start fiddling on your phone in the middle of a meal is considered, you know, has negative connotations uh, for a variety of reasons. One of which, you know, one is, is being distracted, not being engaged, but also, hey, what are you doing? Oh, I'm trying to lose weight. Oh, suddenly you're talking about weight in front of people you may not want to have that conversation with. It's lots of social costs to things. Uh, material costs, of course, spending money, and uh, uh, but also I need to get the right tools for something. I need to, uh, to do other kinds of material um, things. And then temporally, how much time am I predicting this is going to take? And is this going to be a long form, a short form? Is this going to take a long time for it to arrive? Which is why you see Amazon and many mail order things and delivery things like squeezing that time down as aggressively as possible because it, it goes up exponentially very quickly. Um, and then gains-wise, there are all kinds of mental gains like surprise and delight and interesting facts and learning and cur uh, feeding curiosity. Um, aha moments, cleverness, uh, even clever turns of phrase and alliteration and uh, uh, many different things like that. Um, emotionally, uh, things that have a positive emotional association. So you might ask why we have emotional set out as a separate thing. So basically being able to just go through the list and say, where, what am I asking people to do and what, am I, what can I offer them, not in the future, but right away? Like how am I delighting them? How am I entertaining them? How am I intriguing or, or feeding curiosity. So two key things, relentlessly, like way more than you would think, relentlessly cutting costs to your audience. Can't, every single word, every single, I like to say pixel, or persuasion per pixel, every single pixel that's on that page, does it earn its right to be there, either out of necessity to get the, product, the, the practical purpose done, or because it's providing enough juice uh, emotional reward back again through beauty and aesthetics or something else. And then building a continuous dopamine drip. Dopamine being the, the, the reward-seeking neurotransmitter. So of all the things that are positive, dopamine builds that craving for the next thing and next thing. Yet that is something that's feeding that you're constantly uh, having to feed. So simple and rewarding, 
next to humble and compassionate. Um, across those things. So how do we drive more action? We talked about uh, there being delayed rewards, effort, 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 and the, the future rewards don't really pan out. So they're this big. So what we need to do first off is cut as much as possible. That's step one. What can you take out? And in particular, there's a variety uh, of ways to, to cut those costs. You can either uh, remove it completely or simplify it or make it appear simple. So all these things are what they imagine in their head. So it's not the actual cost because they're not in that situation yet. You may not have actually shown them the form you're asking them to fill. You are just told them there's going to be a registration. So they may be imagining something much worse than the reality is. So it's what, they, what it appears. So either you simplify the real thing or the appearance, the expectation of it. Or you delay it. So emotional, uh, uh, so, so does it need to be done right now or can I have them do something later on? And then can you de-emphasize it? So can you make it not draw so much attention to it so it's so salient? Your brain can only pay attention to a very few things at a time. And then lavishly dropping in rewards. Uh, sort of one-to-one. -one. So this is where uh, Suruchi and I, the founders of Live Neuron, we spent a, a, a good amount of time at uh, LeapFrog Toys and also at uh, in, in the games industry. And the real lesson there is like they learned all these meticulous ways of dripping in rewards. It's not as hard. It doesn't have to be points and badges and leaderboards. There's lots of things that can make us enjoy something. So. The takeaway here is next time you're doing your favorite addictive pastime, just kind of notice, like design-wise, what are they doing? What is it that you're reacting to? What is it in your feed? What is it on, like even Netflix shows are being designed the way video games used to be designed in terms of uh, feeding continuous waves of curiosity and things like that, and narrative. That takes us to the behavioral progression model, where again, very, very simple version of it. Um, there's two things that I want to particularly draw attention to here. One is emotional onboarding. So we tend to think we need to get people to do a lot of work right at the beginning. We tend to have these complex registrations, register your product, uh, sign up for something, do all these things as soon as you arrive at a conference or an event. But people way overestimate the buy-in that people have when they show up at their, at their design. You need to win the emotional onboarding first, which means, and then again, look at the video games. Look especially to the runaway hit social video games that uh, have kept the effort so, so simple in the beginning and the rewards so, so high and lavish uh, that, it, that you, you keep wanting to take one step and one step, and then you want to get the aha moment of the product in as, as, as quickly as possible, the recognition of like the feeling, the seeing, the, the experience of what's cool about this product before, if at all possible, before you start asking for money, for information, for lots of effort and learning about how the product's going to work. Um, even just trying to explain the product or offering too many features, like all of that is cognitive load that you're putting on people before they've even decided, hey, I'm kind of, this is kind of cool, I want to do this. And then the next step is, okay, you've got all these efforts. We talked about how hard they are, right? And so how could we ever win? Like we need people to do really, really complicated things for to be responsible citizens, to be engaged in politics, to eat healthy, to, uh, to, um, do, to exercise. Like these are all very complex things. Luckily, our brains have a system for managing this complexity. Obviously, we've still achieved a lot as a society. And the, the method for that is that is built is basically behaviorism. It's like things that are cognitively expensive to do under the right circumstance become go down a path, a habituation progression where something is first weird and unusual and then becomes conscious but effortful when they first use a product but then slowly becomes routinized and easy to interrupt, but then harder to interrupt, and ultimately something that's painful to stop. Now, a lot of these habituated, prog uh, like addictive things that we're engaged in are at this point where it's like we've opened up our favorite social app when, the, when we get the notification or even email before we even are consciously aware of it. It's because 
it has moved from a conscious effort down to the basal ganglia largely, and you can watch this in fMRI. And when you use a product at first and they're watching somebody, it's all this heavy cognitive effort. And then they check in a week later and, or over time, and it's moving down into more and more effort that is non-conscious. And now the costs when you're doing this calculation, suddenly these things for the same exact effort, the same decision or physical behavior, the cost has gone way down. So that allows you to now add more, to ask for more and build on that. So a lot of products go straight to, and we as human beings want to get a fitness app and immediately be like, oh yeah, I'm going hardcore on this, like putting way more steps than is reasonable. Most, most step counters default to a, a level that's unreasonable for the vast majority of the population. And what happens? They fail. They blame themselves. They feel really bad. We need to say, hey, we'll get there, but you need to ask much, much less and build, build this product habit, the habit of engagement, because just having engagement in a product or program or doing anything different, that has a cost already. You're asking an additional cost to what they're doing. So you have to keep the costs low and the rewards high until the brain decides that's worthwhile. To do that, it's consistent, consistency in the cues. There's a reason why Facebook ended up with a, with a single notification style. No matter what kind of cool stuff was happening, then you open it up and find out, oh, I got likes or, or responses or whatever and that so many other places imitated that to the point where like, you have these rolled up notifications now on your phone, and now you just have the blinking light, and that one simple thing is like, oh, something cool might be there, right? Then the response to that, this is just basic uh, um, uh, classical conditioning, or operant conditioning, sorry, um, that the action that follows has to be able to be non-conscious, so it has to be as simple as possible as well. And, and consistent. So you see that thing, you automatically open up their notifications to see what's there. Oh, is that, is that? Okay, now, now I know to click and, and get the next step. At this point, you're getting variable reward, but it, in, in the beginning it has to be, you're aiming for a gratuitous reward and then you can start pulling it back and over time and start asking people to do more work for less reward. But in the beginning, it's gotta be like, this is a happy place for me. I don't open this thing up. I don't start using this product or dealing with this thing, this new effort at work, and feel more stressed than I normally do because I'm already, we're all already overwhelmed, overtaxed, frustrated, confused, and scared based on the media environment we're in. To asking people to take on more of that is counterproductive. It's really exciting to see that you're focusing on social good. But could you talk a little bit about maybe a framework you use? Because you talked about those four modern Fs, and it seems like a lot mm -hmm. of the companies that are the biggest and most dominant have exploited those. So often I start talks, I should have done this, like I hereby promise to use what I learned here tonight for, the, for good, not evil. But, um, and that would have solved it for all of you. So I've set you loose without having that pinky promise. So. Um, so a variety of things on that. I get in this conversation a lot. The whole industry is embroiled in this conversation. Um, and there's a lot of critique coming down. Um, and there are many very, very serious concerns, obviously, and they're mounting. And, and I grew up in a very activist environment that was very much about, you know, there's, there's a lot of enemies around that are misusing the population and uh, are abusive and corrupt. and. And uh, there's a lot of very problematic people, and I've certainly been around boardrooms where I shared wh what I knew uh, in a pitch, and then heard somebody go, hey, 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 we can use people's brains against them, um, which, well, number one, was surprising that that was an insight to them. But number two <laughs> was like, okay, we're not working with this company. But I, I've myself come to a conclusion that's not really productive to find enemies. and feel that that is actually what's going on, is that they're like out to, they're inherently uh, um, evil or like out to, to manipulate. It's a situation that you get to over time as a society and as an individual, and uh, with some exceptions, neurological exceptions. But if you think about 
how frustrating it is as a species and has been for as long as we could actually think about things for you to put all your blood, sweat, and tears into something that you think you know in your heart of hearts is better than what else is out there, that you're doing something good for the world, and largely it's ignored and people use something else instead. And that person, somebody who's doing something differently, is making more money, is gaining power, is whatever it else that humans seek, adoration, popularity, you're going to come to conclusions like, what are they doing? And basically, we keep stumbling upon and falling down the slippery slope of, well, if I do this, then I actually get better outcomes, even though I know it's a worse overall. And I'm willing to compromise this a little bit this day and a little bit more the next day and a little bit more the next day. And suddenly, when the pressure is very, very high, when your kids are hungry, when the street is, is calling, when you're... when you know, things are bad <clears throat> when, the, when the investors are saying, look, we're going to shut you down, then people go down and, and rationalize in their heads, which are more the biases around, look, I did this on purpose, they deserved it, I'm just doing, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. So two things. One, many of these techniques were, have been used throughout history, like the dis rampant destruction of the powerful over the week has been going on worse than today forever, and in many ways is much better. But the techniques used to be hidden within, much, much more hidden in the corridors of power, and now are being democratized as this whole field becomes something that's being published and researched and broadcast and, uh, and available for anybody to test and, and have tools to reach large populations of people. Um, so one, we hope that just sharing this and uh, helps to provide, allow people to know, oh, that's what they're doing to me, like, oh, that, that's not going to work on me. And there's a lot of research on, like, how do we counteract those manipulations. And then the other positive thing, I think, is that we're building to support people doing things that they want to do people who really want to be healthier, who want to be engaged to, uh, in a variety of issues, who want to solve various problems. If you do that and, with their consent, use techniques like these, that's much more powerful. That's got to be much more powerful than doing all these techniques for something that's actually destructive, that they're cognitively aware is hurting them. So the trick is, we need to merge those. Those worlds have been separate. There's been people who've been manipulating either through the dark in ways that people weren't aware they were doing, or people were doing good and didn't know how to use those techniques. And as we bring those together, as tools become toys as well, as they become engaging and beneficial to the individual, to the community, and to the world, we will beat that kind of manipulation. And many companies that are currently manipulating for the worse now when you work with them, when you talk to them, they're filled with people like us that are in just, they, and, and at the very top, they don't want to do this. Like we're seeing people, you know, ex-executives at Facebook who are like, you know, I'm afraid of what we built. Um, so if we can provide environments where people feel uh, supported and, and nourished and happy and safe, then they don't have to go to these extremes to try to, uh, reach those outcomes. You mentioned some examples in games mm -hmm. um, of like having badges or notifications. I've also seen some really naive applications of that where it's too 100%. much and it's horrible. Yeah. So could you give like some examples of what is a good right-sized reward that is not those things or like what makes a good reward? Surprise, delight, uh, aesthetics, beautiful imagery, clever wording, uh, wonderful references, uh, beautiful stories, feeding curiosity. Where curiosity, I think, is one of the most most powerful and endlessly reusable. Is is to um, keep and, and you see that being used really well or very poorly. Actually, in the case of uh, fake news and clickbait, you know they they've abused it. But we are endlessly curious creatures. And if we provide uh, interesting things and keep promising interesting things and keep feeding that, then you can keep attention for a very long time. But there's a, a lot of them across all six dimensions. So just keep those six dimensions in mind and ask yourself, why did I not shut off Netflix before 
I intended to or whatever you're binge watching or why am I playing a little bit longer than I intended or why am I looking at the phone instead of talking to the people around me. What is it design-wise? Like what are the mechanisms? What is attracting you to that? I find myself playing video games for longer than I want to or should. And so when you, know, when you say that, when you say, you know, keep an eye out for what's keeping you watching Netflix or doing this or that, yeah. can you maybe uh, like say some examples of the types of things that, like, what, what should we be on the lookout for? What are some key, what are some indicators? Emotionally, I, I, we've been kind of mixing these up because they're, they're actually uh, hard for you guys off the bat to discern, which isn't, is ma it doesn't matter as much that you've put them in the right category so much as that you take the time to think in each category and say, hmm, what are some of the physical benefits to interacting with this thing? Um, so Facebook, so getting a like is, uh, is social. So that's a, it's a big one. The like button is probably the biggest most like the cheapest, most rewarding action humans have ever invented, which is why social media, I mean, it's like extraordinary. You don't even have to look them in the eye. You don't have to say anything, formulate words. You're just like, I approve of you being in the tribe. You are a good thing. It actually reduce, releases oxytocin for you and dopamine to you and to the receiver. So it's beneficial both ways, um, unless of course, you're judging them harshly, and they feel judged on that. All that's bad stuff about social as well, but uh, is it a risk? But yes, that's powerful. So every time you click, or every time you're um, in interrupted in your feasting on this stuff, you become more conscious and start to think about whether you should actually do this or not. Which is why all the long scrolls and Netflix auto playing the next thing and not even going through. Like they keep clipping more and more off the ends in the beginnings in order to keep you going. Um, so it's a, it's a little hard to identify. So emo, uh, it's both emotional and physical is when you smile at something and when you laugh at something, you're both, it's that you're emotionally responding, but there's a physical manifestation of that emotion which releases all kinds of effects. Laughter gets you taking deeper breaths. Um, gasping at things gets you breathing deeper, mm -hmm. so you're doing certain changes there um, that are physical. Uh, whether they counteract the hunched over, like holding your arm out in front of you and the bumps in the head from walking around without looking, it's hard to say, but temporally is also that's a little bit of an odd one, so I'll just in general speak to that. Uh, there's a lot to be said about how time plays out in our valuation of things. But uh, the cost of c having to take more time is, is on the cost side. But if you can cut people's time, that's on the gain side. Um, creating urgency can get people to, it's a cost, but it can get people to act. But if you do too much and get people frantic, then you're actually adding cost to people. It doesn't feel good. Um, if you can bring future goals closer, that's a gain. It doesn't feel as far away, so it's over a net positive. Or push costs that they have to pay further into the future. That's another type of gain. Um, so there's a, uh, there are some other weirder ones related to temporal as well. Uh, material can also be um, digital material things. So gaining digital goods. So like where Fortnite makes all of its like, ungodly amounts of money is selling digital clothes at the prices as much or higher than people are paying for real clothes. So like a new skin, and I know because I play, my son and I play a lot, a new skin can be like $25, $30 for one version of it um, or higher if it's something like really premium. So that's something like why would somebody pay for like bits like that? But when you think about it, they're playing with friends that they've made in countries that we've historically been at war with that they would never be friends with in any other context and learning about them. And yet, they never get to see them and show off the clothes and the things that they care about and their personality and style of the physical stuff they have. So they have to do it through the way they speak and communicate through the game, but also what they wear and the emotes and behaviors they can purchase as well. You said something really interesting um, about delayed gratification. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering if 
something you said gave me the idea that people who are really good at a delayed gratification mm -hmm. um, are actually giving themselves some sort of immediate yeah. uh, immediate uh, satisfaction for the delayed gratification task. Yeah. Um, so for example, like if I put money in my 401k, yeah. what I'm actually getting is is a good feeling now for potentially a later benefit. Yeah, that's a deep, deep subject. It's super fascinating, and a lot of research is trying to untangle. Broadly speaking, yes, either they're getting they're getting immediate benefits in some way, or they're um, they have managed to avoid the temptations. They've manipulated the situation. So those of you who, how, how many of you've all heard of the marshmallow test, right? Okay, so we think of that as like a willpower test, right? And that's uh, Colloquially, you know, the media talks about it that way, but the the researcher who did that immediately was describing that the kids who did best at a preventing, uh, eat, uh, who avoiding eating the marshmallow, they basically were reducing, re removing the temptation or pr protecting themselves from the temptation. They would cover over the marshmallow. They would turn around. They would go to the other side of the room. They would drag, distract themselves cognitively by singing a song. They would use social forces by hanging out with other kids that were also staying away from the marshmallows and talking about why they wanted two marshmallows instead of one. They were doing a lot of tricks, which is, is likely that that is really, willpower may very well devolve into just being really good at increasing your costs uh, or your perceived costs or minimizing uh, sorry, or increasing the gains in your head, but um, but also just changing the, the question altogether. Your brain can only focus on a few things at a time. So one of the big things is just crowding out temptations, which is something you could be doing in your designs as well. So there's that whole category of solution. Another area that we haven't talked about here is that um, you can do various techniques to increase future self-identification, which may improve hyperbolic discounting of the future or future discounting by helping you uh, emote or feel the pain or pleasure of that future outcome. Because that's one of the powers of the cognitive brain is to help you uh, to help to build basically a hallucination around. We're hallucinating real life anyway, and the cognitive brain can can try to direct attention to different parts of that hallucination that's happening now, or have you obsessing about something in the past that's good or bad, or have you thinking about potential futures so that if you know people who are really good at constantly focusing on the futures because they feel the pain, they're like constantly living in that future place, the pain or pleasure of this outcome. So that's something you can design to and that you can develop uh, habits of doing. Robin, to pick up on the marshmallow and the, and mm -hmm. the grid and the Duckworth stuff, there's a mm -hmm. blowback in education that we're just blaming the victim. Like your your grit and determination is not, you, yeah. know, you can't blame people because they don't have it, um, which can often break on socioeconomic lines as well. So I'm curious your right. thoughts there. Yeah, so the, the researcher on willpower is uh, Walter Mischel. That's distinct from from uh, Grit and Duckworth's work, who, which has been criticized. And basically, you can't be an academic researcher doing anything interesting without being criticized, on the one hand. That's how it's supposed to work. And that's one of the reasons why you get things like replication errors. That's a good thing. That means that they're being tested and challenged. But um, in particular, that outcome, what I just described, is to say, isn't to say that the, you or that person or somebody should be doing those things. It's more of a question of, okay, how do we systematically build those capabilities, either uh, um, molding brains to be able to do that, right? School should be doing that, as opposed to school does an awful lot of just assuming that you're either giving it your all or you're not, instead of saying, how do we build, how do we work? I mean, they're trying really hard, to be honest, but there's a lot of work to be done there. Or how do we improve systems such that we automatically are removing temptations? We're automatically at least offering the option of removing temptations so that when you, your default option for Hotels.com or, or Expedia or whoever you book your, your hotels, it has a default set in there that don't leave 
all those snacks out in my hotel room, remove them. I want to be in rooms that don't have those out. Or to have a standing option in, uh, at restaurants where they know before, just by how you've checked in, not to show you the dessert menu at the end or not to bring the bread out in the first place. You should be able to make decisions once and have those things like isolated from your options. Okay, thanks everyone.